This is episode 603 of the Rio Grande Foundation's Tipping Point New Mexico. I'm Paul Guessing, president of the Rio Grande Foundation, New Mexico's free market think tank. You can find out more about the foundation at riograndefoundation.org. I am very pleased to be joined by Sam Ledoux. Sam is a newly minted uh, city councilor in Española, New Mexico, and uh, somebody who's been involved in political activities for quite a long time, and I've known Sam for quite a long time. So welcome to Tipping Point New Mexico, Sam Ledoux. Good to be here, Paul. Yeah, well, uh, congratulations again for your uh, successful race and for uh, getting involved in issues in your community. Um, why don't we just uh, introduce you to our audience and uh, share a little bit about yourself and uh, your ties to Española? But you know, feel free to go into a little bit of your political activism and career because you've been uh, somebody who I've known for quite a while and you've been involved in a lot of issues in uh, in New Mexico public policy and other states as well uh, from Arizona to DC. Yes, well, my, my name is Sam Ledoux, and I'm the new city councilor here in Española's 4th District. I've been involved in Española for a long time. I grew up in Española over on the east side where I now represent. I grew up in the Valley Estates neighborhood. Um, I went to both Española and Powake public schools, and I grew up in this area, so it's very important to me. I've had generations of family members who grew up in the valley, not maybe in the city of Española in particular, but the surrounding areas. I've had most of my family has uh, either taught or worked for the Española public schools. So I have a very deep um, connection to the city and to the community. And I've been involved in politics since I was in high school. Um, I first got involved with Susanna Martinez's race in 2010. And that's what inspired me to get involved in politics. I really uh, was upset by by the things I saw from the Richardson administration when I was in high school. And I wanted to do my part to change that. So I, when I turned 18, I registered as a Republican, which went against the grain of most of my family. And uh, decided to help Susanna Martinez in the primary where I could. And after high school, I got involved in the Santa Fe County Republican Party. Um, it's very lonely to be a Republican in Santa Fe County, but I did the best I could through our, my activism, got hired by Susanna's campaign for the reelection campaign and uh, was in charge of the Las Vegas area. After the election, I worked in the state legislature um, when because we run the house back for the first time, worked there for two years while I was going to college. Um, then I worked on the final race for Senator John McCain. I then worked in various races throughout the country and in New Mexico, just uh, little one off special elections here and there. And then I decided to go get a graduate degree in DC at George Washington University. While I was doing that, I worked on Larry Hogan's reelection campaign in Maryland and worked in his administration for three years. Then I worked for the administration of Governor Doug Ducey in Arizona for a year. And I finally decided to come home last year where I worked the legislative session. Then I started doing uh, working for FEMA on the Hermit's Peak Calf Canyon recovery efforts. And then I decided to work in the Española Public Schools myself. And I ran for city council. I ended up winning. So I'm here back in my home community. I'm going to do my best to make a difference here. Now, I've got to ask, um, you know, Española, not a Republican hotbed, even in uh, deep blue New Mexico. Uh, what specifically or, you know, anything specific uh, attracted you to the Republican Party as a relatively young Hispanic man in the uh, in northern New Mexico, because that's uh, that's an unusual decision, shall we say? Yes. What really attracted me to the Republican Party at the time was that I saw that the inefficiencies in government, and it really it attracted me to hear um, at the time, you know, people like Senator McCain and people in the Republican Party advocating for a pare down of what he what I remember Senator McCain calling 
the pork barrel spending and, you know, all of these different things that were causing the government in New Mexico to be embarrassing. Like you saw tons of huge projects by Bill Richardson because he was trying to run for president and he was just working as fast as he could to get projects out there, even if they didn't make sense. And one that I know that you've been, a, that has been a big uh, hobby horse for you, Paul, is the rail runner where the rail runner initially started off as a decent idea as a transport for state workers. And then they kind of shoehorned it into being a consumer rail, which it was never designed to be. And now you, for the low cost, it used to be of $8. I don't know if it's increased. You can go from Santa Fe to Albuquerque in two and a half hours. <laughs> so um, just general inefficiencies like that and general ideas just being ruined by bureaucracy it made me want to see the government be more better and more efficient and less wasteful and if you look at northern new mexico politics and you look at some of the local governments here waste is the name of the game um rio reba county is infamous for a lot of what we latinos call movidas which is kind of like you know using public money to benefit your friends or to contractors in, in that you know, rather than actually trying to get the best possible bids. And it was that sort of stuff that made me say, you know, I'm a lot more, cons I'm already a lot more conservative culturally. I think I, you know, fiscally, I'm also more conservative based on these ideas. All right. Well, um, we, we could definitely talk at length about your political philosophies and issues in the Republican Party today. Maybe that's another uh, uh, something we can talk about later on in the show. But uh, uh, you now are elected in local office and uh, you do not run as a Republican, not because you're not necessarily a Republican, but because those are uh, nonpartisan races that you ran in. Uh, what did you run for office as? And, you know, we talked about off air you were readily identifiable as a Republican. It's not like that was a uh, a big secret. So uh, how do, you know, what, what issues do you uh, plan to uh, talk about and what were you running on? And how do people receive kind of that more conservative message uh, in Espanola? Like you're not the first Republican to win local office, for example. No, in fact, uh, my councilmate, you see Espanol has an eight member council and we have two members per council, a district. And uh, my councilmate is also a Republican. So the fourth district is represented by two Republicans on the council. And uh, a lot of it, I think, is also partially to our success as both of us are fairly moderate Republicans. And we don't really um, harp on a lot of the cultural or national issues like many Republicans unfortunately do when they run for local office. And I think that was a major part of my success as well is because I was focused more on the, you know, tabletop issues that people were facing rather than trying to focus in on a lot of the national issues. But a lot of these are national issues in their own way, homelessness, um, the drug epidemic and uh, the crime is issues that are exploding here in the city are the main topics of focus as well as, you know, the general lack of trust in the government in, at the city level. Um, the current administration has struggled to gain the, the trust of the people. Um, the current mayor won his election by a very narrow margin in one of the lowest turnout mayoral elections in the history of the city. And uh, that has caused a lot of people, like he didn't come in with a mandate and he faced a lot of criticism and he did not respond to that criticism very well, which has led to just constant conflicts with uh, local community members and the media. And, uh, you know, he's, there's also been lots of scandals at city hall over the last two years. And I think that's the type of environment that I was coming in. I came, I ran as a change candidate. I wanted to be something different. I wanted to hold, the administration accountable. Um, that was my main message is that, you know, a lot of people 
have expressed frustration and I wanted to be the voice of that frustration on the city council because at that time and even currently still the mayor has a majority and uh, the mayor has been able to basically um, do whatever he pleases without being questioned and I feel like there should be a voice on that council that is a little bit more active in talking about um, the failures of this administration and try to push them to get back on the right track because we are facing some of the most unprecedented issues of Espanola's history. Businesses are closing left and right. Um, we have a massive homelessness crisis. I remember growing up, there was maybe like four or five homeless people. And now we have no idea how many there are. There were 40 some parked and uh, camped in the parking lot of Goodwill. There's 20 some in the shelter. Uh, the city tells me that the encampment that they've uh, put under the bridge had at least 28 tents. So we, at the very least, at the very minimum, we're looking at around 100 homeless people now, which is an explosion in the population, especially for a small town of 10,000 people. Okay, and I do want to talk about those policies, but uh, you know, I, I would be remiss if I didn't ask. You know, Republicans have been looking at northern New Mexico, especially as the Democratic Party has slid further and further to the left, and wondering how can they attract more uh, Hispanic Nortenos to uh, vote for their party. Uh, would you say that you know, just focusing on some of these? corruption or government incompetence issues is the way to go uh, from your perspective, at least? I think that's a lot of it. And just focusing on what people face every day, like the homelessness crisis here is unignorable. I mean, you can't ignore it. Like everyone knows someone who's had things stolen from their yard. Everyone knows someone who, you know, is afraid to go into Walmart because there's several people parked in the parking lot trying to ask them for money, some friendly and some not so much. Everyone has to go to the gas station and hear them play uh, classical music at loud volumes so that people don't loiter around the building. These are the realities of the situation. Um, it's affecting everybody's everyday lives. At Walgreens here in Española, they started locking batteries behind the counter because people were stealing them. Um, they had to lock a lot of the shaving materials for the same reason. And they put a limit on how much tinfoil you could buy because it's often used for fent fentanyl smoking. And um, we're suffering, you know, just ordinary people are suffering because of the choices made by some of the people who... Uh, like the addicts that aren't getting help and the homeless people who are in the area. And it's affecting people's lives on a personal level. Um, McDonald's for years has been one of the most popular restaurants here in Española. And just recently they had to put a code lock on their doors for the bathrooms. Like when people's ordinary lives are impacted by some of the poor policy decisions made, that's a strong argument for Republicans to make. But honestly, the biggest barrier for Republicans in New Mexico has to do with the fact that they are really focused on national issues and they're really focused on their ties to Donald Trump, who is an incredibly unpopular figure in the Hispanic community in New Mexico. And um, although tying yourself to Trump can win you a primary in a general election, it's a gigantic liability. And the obsession with tying the entire party to the fortunes of Trump, to the ideas of Trump. I went to the Republican Party convention um, for New Mexico last weekend, and there probably wasn't a sentence uttered on the stage that didn't mention Donald Trump. And that's part of the problem, is that we're so focused on the presidential election that we're letting a lot of the local issues slip through the cracks. And we're not only focused, not, not only, if it would be one thing if Trump was popular in the state, but he's incredibly unpopular. Um, in my election, even though I was running for city council, I had to, I was asked questions about Trump all the time because they wanted to know if I was associated with him, if I was tied with him, if uh, I had, what I thought about him. A lot of the problem is, is that a lot of people see the Republican party today as the party of Trump, because that's literally, it seems like we, all we can talk about. And um, I hope 
that one day we could try to focus on actually trying to win elections and be focused on local issues, because that is where I think the Republican Party ever since 2016 has just lost the plot. Totally fair. And, uh, you know, uh, we, we'll just leave it there when it comes to uh, the president's uh, former and possibly future. But I will uh, I, I you know, want to ask you now about the homeless issue. Uh, now, Espanola has long struggled with a whole array of social and uh, economic and you know just challenges in, in Espanola. And I'm sure you you're aware of those having grown up there. Is the homeless situation something kind of new, though? Uh, certainly, in the time I've spent in Albuquerque, uh, the homeless problem has gotten much, much worse. You drive through Espanola, uh, you know, you're not really spending time there, but there's undoubtedly more homeless in Espanola, as there are across cities and uh, places all over our country. Um, it, I, I'm assuming you agree that this is more of a problem. Uh, what are some of the solutions that you're trying to you're going to try to uh, consider there or do you have solutions at this point yet regarding homelessness well the big issue is is that we don't really know where to uh, tackle the head of the monster here because the biggest issue that's driving the homelessness population to espanola is undoubtedly the drugs and until we can get a grip on the opioid crisis we are not going to have any ability to tackle this issue effectively because Espanola, we're a relatively low income town. We don't have that many services for homeless people. And the, you know, a lot of people aren't giving them that much money. You have to ask, why are they here? They're here because of the drugs. Um, fentanyl based pills are everywhere. And I spoke to one of the ladies at El Centro, which is a health clinic um, here in Espanola. And they told me that blues, which is the type, the nick, the street drug name for fentanyl pills, um, blues are going for a dollar a piece. And when you're when you're going when they're going for a dollar a piece to three dollars a piece, you're talking about something that's as cheap as coffee, and it's an incredibly hard drug to control. I'm hoping the state legislature. Um, follows through with some of the ideas that they proposed about, um, you know, there's a, there's some proposals by Senator Baca and Senator Brantley, this legislative special legislative session about increasing the um, sentencing for distribution of fentanyl. I think that'll go a long way in helping some of our police force. But honestly, we need a jail here in Espanola. Espanola used to have a jail and over time, unfortunately, it had to close because of the deterioration. And they had like special contracts with Rio Reba County and Santa Fe County and Taos County and McKinley County to transport um, people, people to jail. But unfortunately, some of those deteriorate, uh, some of those uh, relationships have been strained by the sheer volume of the crime epidemic that has strained all jails. And the lack of a jail here in Espanola in particular has been a struggle for almost a decade. It's something that needs to get done. We need to focus on it. I think that'll go a long way. I think increasing, like I said, sentencing um, for fentanyl possession or distribution will go a long way. I think just increased presence of police. Um, our police force has struggled mightily with staffing. Unfortunately, that will probably get worse um, due to the fact that state police have increased their salaries and it'll be very difficult for the city to compete with that. Um, those are some of the issues that we are struggling with. And I think that most municipalities are struggling with. But if you look at Taos, for instance, or you look at Los Alamos or other neighboring smaller communities, they're not suffering the same issues that Espanola is. They haven't seen the same spike in homelessness as we do. It has to do with the, the number one issue, which is drugs in this city. And it's been an issue since the 1970s, as you know, um, when heroin came back from the Vietnam War. This was the first hotbed of the opioid epidemic, and it has just continued and has gotten worse. And I think the New Mexican called us the town that tried everything. We've tried everything. We've tried harm reduction. We've tried recovery. We've tried really hard crackdown and enforcement. I think a good balance of the two is the best way to at least try to control it. 
but unfortunately the city has just not made it a priority um a lot of the local politicians here like to say oh it's happening everywhere it's not that bad here and we're just like everywhere else it was just we just have a stigma but if you look at the raw numbers that's just not the case um most places don't have sharps containers in their public parks most places don't have sharps containers in every ba public bathroom in the city like that is a uniquely espanola thing it's something that we need to uh, you know understand so that we could tackle it and actually try to address this issue head on rather than trying to wash it off as people bashing the city so um the, the Paul Gessling solution uh, to the, all this is that uh, we need a statewide effort to increase uh, workforce participation. There's been some really interesting studies from the Legislative Finance Committee showing um, associated issues with the lack of workforce participation in New Mexico and how that impacts negative externalities like drug use, like crime, uh, you know, and the studies are great and all, but they, their solutions are lacking. My my solutions involve uh, essentially making work more attractive than uh, welfare and staying around on your couch playing video games. So uh, we need statewide policies and preferably federal policies that disincentivize uh, sloth and reduce the barriers to work. Uh, we could talk about all those and yeah, this isn't necessarily Sam Ledoux is going to do all this. This is the legislature and others, but we obviously need to dramatically reform and overhaul our education system and uh, and generally make New Mexico more competitive uh, with higher paying jobs and better opportunities. Uh, given your knowledge of not only Española, but politics as a whole, uh, is, the, is the guessing solution... Uh, where you would like to see things go, whether you can control it or not in, in Espanola uh, there? I think the guessing solution is relevant, but the problem is, is that the drug manufacturing has become so cheap that unless we start, uh, unless we start cracking down on the distribution networks and raising the cost of drugs, we're facing a situation where, like I said earlier, one to two, one to three dollars a pill. You could, with just begging like an hour outside or something, you could get enough money to be high for the whole day. Like it doesn't take a lot to actually, you know, be high, and that low that lowers the ability or the, uh, you know, it it doesn't create enough barriers for the addict to realize maybe I'd be better off doing something else. That is one right. of the biggest problems with opioids in general is that just how it grips your brain chemistry. And when it's that cheap of a barrier to entry, um, it will be hard for the workforce to compete in the same type of way. But you grew up in Española and you didn't become a drug. I mean, maybe I maybe I don't know. Uh, and I don't want to make light of uh, your past, but uh, I'm presuming that you never got into that lifestyle and you saw people that you grew up with probably on both sides of that equation who did and did not get into uh, the drugs and all those issues. Now, I'm sure it probably wasn't always um, something you could easily tell, but you can grow up in Española, go on to be successful and avoid uh, drugs. Uh, you know, it, it's just a matter of uh, wanting to do other and better things with your life than just uh, hang out and get high. And I, I mean, I think that can be said for people across the country. It's just Española suffers from more of the societal ills that um, allow or encourage that behavior. Right. I think a lot of it, too, is that in Española is in a unique situation because it's a multi-generational crisis. For a lot of the other opioid epidemic-facing communities, like we see in West Virginia and Ohio, um, it is only... The first generation. This is the first generation of people that are addicted to these substances. Whereas Española, we're probably on the third or fourth generation in a lot of cases. And there's a lot of familial ties to taking it. And the thing about opioids as opposed to other drugs is that you could take it and live pretty functionally. Like um, as long as you're constantly taking it. Um, with the homelessness population though, it's a different story. Um, many of them are already addicts and they're just moving to the area because of the ease of access. 
Um, I have seen a lot of recovery efforts do focus on job training. We have a uh, program called the Eagle Village, or it's at the Eagle Village, which used to be like uh, like a makeshift dorms for the for Northern New Mexico College. It's called Pathways Village now. Pathways Village Recovery that specifically focuses on retraining um, recovered addicts to uh, the workforce. They've had big successes in that front. Um, I think some of the uh, some of our local retail store managers. Our, our alumni of that program. Um, and we've also seen similar successes from Darren's place in, in Española as well. So there is a lot of effort on that front, but the problem is, is that the demand is out. I mean, the supply is outweighing now. Well, basically there's way more addicts and homeless folks now in Española than they ever anticipated with these programs. Like, for instance, there's Pathways Shelter, which was the first homelessness shelter that opened in Española. It has around 20 beds. They're completely full all the time. And they have 47 uh, tents in their parking lot of people waiting to get in. The problem mm -hmm. is that a lot of these social services designed to help these people get off their feet and into the workforce are overwhelmed. And the wait list could be, you know, months and months and months and months just to even get a bed. So... Mm -hmm. We're suffering on multiple fronts in that regard. Is that the resources in Española are just not there? That's why I wish the state would step in and help relocate some of these folks, the ones who want help, to areas that have the resources to help them. Because our resources are taxed way beyond their their capacity to deal with the issue. All right. Well, um, just as a quick recommendation, uh, the book "Hillbilly Elegy," which talks about Appalachia and it's of course now Senator J.D. Vance's uh, story autobiogra uh, autobiography um, when I read that myself I uh, thought of the many many parallels between you know kind of the uh, culture of Española and the culture of Appalachia and uh, having grown up myself in Ohio it's um, you know kind of uh, interesting to draw those parallels but I also think uh uh, it's it's a great read and a fascinating story um, of somebody who did ultimately overcome uh, those those challenges. But uh, let's talk about a few kind of broader challenges. Um, you know, obviously, Española not uh, you know not always on the list of economically successful places. They face a lot of challenges. Uh, also, crime uh, has been a long term challenge there. Uh, but let's Let's focus on especially the economy and kind of where where you can work to improve economic outcomes, understanding that you're dealing with uh, some of these other challenges and how they're all related. But uh, talk about the Española econ economy a little bit. Well, this is honestly the worst I've seen the Española economy since the 2008 recession. Um wow. We are constantly seeing um, stores starting to close in Española. We just had our last car dealership um, basically close up shop. And the reason given is because of the rising crime rate causing uh, people to basically, uh, what I was told by one of the people involved is that their catalytic converters were being stolen constantly out of the new cars and they couldn't afford to stay there. And we're facing other challenges with getting new retailers because they tell us the same thing, that um, the insurance costs could prohibit them from even making a profit. Uh, until we get a, a, a grip on these crime issues, we suffer a lot of challenges just normally because we're a two county city and one of the county has much higher tax rates than the other county that we we reside in. In fact, I think a, about a decade ago, you and I spoke about this and you wrote an article for your heirs of enchantment about how Española being a two county um, city, you could physically see, you know, parts of the town that were in Santa Fe County because they were less developed, older, and uh, a lot of the buildings just weren't filled because of the high tax rates versus the ones in Rio Riba. And in fact, if you see close to my district and in my district, um, because we're in Rio Riba and because we had easier access to development, we have most of the retail space on this side of town. We have Walmart, GameStop, we have um, 
you know, Walgreens, all the fast food restaurants, they're all on this side of the city because it was more open to development. It was more, uh, it was more, uh, it was just easier to develop there. It was also easier to get there because the tax rates were lower and you saw an explosion in my childhood. Like when I started growing up, there was no Walmart. We had to go get clothes from Santa Fe. You had to get everything from Santa Fe. And then when Walmart opened in Española, you just saw an explosion of retail um, hit our side of the city. And we became like a little destination center for all of Northern New Mexico and pretty much Southern Colorado as well. And that's being put at risk because of the high crime issues. Because let's be honest, Santa Fe is only a 30 minute drive away. And if you can avoid some of the other social ills that come when you're trying to shop in a city like Española, why wouldn't you just drive that extra 30 minutes? And now, that's, oh, go. that's the largest economic problem that we're facing. Now, um, do you fault the local political leadership for not uh, aggressively enough enforcing crime? I mean, you know, that's the thing with crime is that uh, there are so many different factors. There's culture, there's uh, the enforcement mechanism uh, at the city level, there's the, the courts, uh, you know, state laws. Uh, what, what do you see as the issues surrounding crime that kind of are above and beyond what's traditionally already been the case there in Española? I think enforcement's a big issue. It has a lot to do with the fact that um, the police force is much smaller than it was just even a couple years ago. Um, that has a lot to do with the change in administrations and, and different personnel conflicts. Um, and that's had a dramatic impact on the city itself. And if you want a good example of how inf just increasing enforcement could have dramatic changes, you don't have to look too far. You could look at Powake. Powake has really invested in their police force under this new governor. I've been really impressed with her, actually. Um, she hired Freddie Trujillo, and Freddie Trujillo has turned that Powake Police Department into something I've never seen before. Um, they started enforcing, you know, traffic laws. They started enforcing uh, crime over there at Buffalo, I mean, at the Butterfly Springs Trailer Park. I've never seen Powake as clean as, uh, a, you know, as crime-free as it's been under this current governor that they have over there and uh, under Freddie Trujillo. And you're seeing impacts on the economy. They just opened a, a lot of burger there. They opened, they're opening restaurants left and right. They had lot of burger. They had uh, Tewa sticks. They had um, barrio fries. They had McDonald's. All of this opened up just in the last couple of years. The development of Powake has basically exploded as they tried to tackle their crime issue. And that is just a big testament about how just a little bit goes a long way. And unfortunately, Espanola has seen the opposite. Um, with the reduction in crime, with the reduction in police force, I mean, with the reduction in our police force, the reduction of enforcement, um, we've just seen an explosion in crime. And these are just two neighboring towns, and they're basically... Uh, they have very similar populations, and there's no excuse for what's happened in Espanola, to be honest with you. And, uh, you know, northern New Mexico, I know uh, Los Alamos National Lab has grown and hired large numbers of people, and they, of course, always are dealing with housing challenges uh, there uh, around Los Alamos. Of course, Santa Fe, widely publicized as well, uh, their housing challenges and the high cost of housing uh you know i i would say that uh, it seems like espanola if they could sustain a uh, a drop in crime over kind of a five to ten year period it would seem like that city would would be in a great position to uh, grow and become a bit of a bedroom community for some of those big um you know big economic powerhouses there in northern New Mexico. And that's traditionally what we were. Um, we we were either a pass-through uh, city, like you said in earlier, um, servicing tourists and also acted as a, you know, a community where many people who work at the lab or work at the state um, lived in. 
And, you know, unfortunately, the crime rate and some of the problems has led to a lot of uh, of those type of uh, citizens moving to places like Powake or moving just outside the city to places like La Masia, Royo Seco, um, Velarde, Alcalde. We've seen kind of Española become extremely stagnant in its population. If you look at the census data, Española is one of the few areas in um, the valley and in the Santa Fe just general area that has stagnated in its population. Um, we're just about the same way as we just have about the same population as we did 10 years ago. And that's not sustainable. Like Espanola was on a growth path and a lot of our um, GRTs are based around growth. A lot of our industries were based around continued growth and uh, we're not seeing that. So we're not benefiting from the growing populations around us because less people are choosing to shop here. I mean, I hear it every day from some of my constituents. I work at the labs and I don't shop in Española. I live here, but I would rather do my shopping at Smith's and Los Alamos, or I'd rather, you know, since I work in Santa Fe, I'd rather just buy from some of the grocery stores like Whole Foods or whatever there. And they don't buy at Walmart and Española or Food King because they don't feel safe doing so. That's one of the biggest downsides is that we're losing a lot of the GRT that would be generated in the city because of the safety issue. And, you know, we lost car dealerships. And for a small town, car dealerships are the biggest GRT generators because what's the most expensive thing you buy besides a house? It's a car. And Española used to have a ton of car dealerships. Growing up, I knew we, we had at least six or seven. Like, And now we don't have any. That's a huge hit to our economy. Well, I don't want to uh, further depress you, Sam, on the car dealership front. But of course, uh, as you know, we've been working uh, to push back as hard as possible against the governor and her uh, plans to force electric vehicles on New Mexicans, which uh, may not be the proximate reason for uh, Española's dearth of car dealerships, but it's not going to do anything to help uh, car dealers across the state of New Mexico, uh, because I think uh, a lot of folks who want that traditional internal combustion engine are going to uh, go out of state, specifically to Texas, once, uh, once that mandate kicks in in just uh, about two years. So uh, unfortunately, crime is the current reason, but uh, there's there's other policies on the horizon that are going to hurt car dealers. But it's uh, it's great of you to mention that, uh, unsolicited by me, by the way, uh, the importance of car dealers to those uh, kind of smaller to mid-sized cities and the gross receipts tax that they pay. Exactly. I mean, it's, uh, it's the lifeblood of many municipalities. And uh you know, putting any restrictions on them will have dire consequences, especially since electric vehicles, um, like the most popular electric vehicle brand, Tesla, they can't even operate um, car dealerships because of some of the current regulations. That's why they have to operate in often sovereign nations. Like we have a Tesla dealership in Nambea close by. That couldn't exist in Española, for instance. All right. Well, um, we're going to have to wrap things up, but I do want to give you a chance to uh, you know, offer any other points or uh, any information that we might have missed in our conversation. Well, I want to say that for a lot of the problems I pointed out today, Española is one of the most amazing places that I've ever had the privilege of living in. I love this city. I want to see it get back to the way it was and start thriving again. And we would love for you to come to our city and see us. We're filled with some of the friendliest people you can imagine. And I would love to talk to anyone who wants to come to Espanola. All right. Thank you, Sam Ledoux. And uh, we will leave it there. Uh, thanks for listening to this week's episode. Find all episodes at tippingpointsnm.com or at the Rio Grande Foundation's YouTube channel. Subscribe to the show at Apple, Stitcher, or tell Google Home to play Tipping Point New Mexico. Thanks to Path3 Marketing for producing this show.